It's my great honor and privilege to welcome Honorable Ministers Smriti Irani, Women and Child Development and Minority Affairs, to our VC Equal Summit. She's the youngest Union Cabinet Minister in the current government and also the first woman to hold the office of the Ministry of Education and Textiles. One of the notable achievements was in the recent past when we were all locked down during the COVID. She galvanized public and private sector to make India the second largest producer of PPE within three months during the pandemic lockdown. Madam Minister was also named the global leader from India for 2015 by World Economic Forum. Thank you so much, ma'am, for joining us. Thank you for having me. At PNG, we aspire to create a company and a world where equality and inclusion is achievable for all. We believe that equal opportunity to learn, grow, and thrive should be available to everyone. Over the years, PNG has committed to several actions needed to advance progress towards creating an equal and inclusive world. One important step we take to advance equality and inclusion is to come together every year in this summit, which we call VC Equal. And to just take a look at what we have done so far, and more importantly, the runway to do is so, so much, and it's, it's important to get thought leaders like you to, to this summit to talk about what more can be done, both by a, a company like us, by our brands, and also overall the corporate world. We, this year's theme is unique and united. We truly believe that our differences make us stronger, and therefore, we are celebrating the uniqueness and coming together united to pave the way for a more equal and inclusive tomorrow. To start with, I want to first ask you about your personal journey. You are one of the leading voice for equality here in India. As someone who has broken glass ceiling and has a journey which has spanned across different roles, both personally and professionally, how have you personally experienced the progress on gender equality over time? I think that my generation has had it fairly easy compared to my mother's. Gender equality or equity for that matter is an issue which is much discussed now, deliberated upon by policy makers, made essential by economists who uh, now want nations to thrive by ensuring that if a policy or for that matter if a fiscal rule has a gender component it is more likely to succeed than a policy which is bereft of the gender idea. And I say this because I have seen my mother's generation uh, be challenged by nuanced positions uh, which were not very uh, evocative uh, but which were so layered that uh, most of the injustice was spoken of in whispers. Uh, for instance, the fact that a woman would want to make a choice of what kind of a family situation she'd choose to be a part of, uh, the fact that she would make a choice of what kind of a vocation she would want to be a part of, the fact that a woman would s choose to position herself as a woman who is not attached to a marriage, as a woman who chooses not to give birth, as a woman who chooses to, yes, take the family away uh, and give up possibly a career, or for that matter, a woman who chooses not to partake in a relationship only so that she can focus on her ambition. Now, these are complexities that were never discussed openly during my mother's generation. The fact that my generation could not only discuss it, but we went halfway there by, by standing our ground, uh, I think is what is different about these two generations. Uh, these issues possibly are not issues which are very, very uh, central now to discourse in my daughter's generation. If I told my daughter today that in your grandmother's generation, uh, it was frowned upon if a woman chose not to get married till she was 30, my daughter would wonder why. Uh, but in today's generation, if I say that more and more women would want to prioritize their careers in their early 20s, nobody would blink an eye. So I think generationally, gender justice has become easier as an issue to deal with, not only by women, but also men. Uh, if you look at my parents' generation, and uh, uh, if you look at issues like buying a sanitary pad, 
Now, that is not something that men would uh, uh, be a part of. Uh, you know, sanitary pads would get hidden in newspapers, in black plastic bags. Many still do it of that generation. Um, uh, my generation possibly had fathers be an equal part uh, of, uh, you know, the menstrual hygiene conversation in a family. Uh, my daughter's generation uh, wouldn't even, uh, you know, uh, think twice about such a conversation that a male parent needs to have within a family system. So, I think not only perspectives of women, but also men have changed. And it does great injustice when we look at the realm of gender justice only from the prism of whether those looking at it are women. I think it's equally a man's issue as much as it uh, a women's issue. Um, and I think that is again a big change uh, when it comes to gender justice in my generation. My mother's generation, uh, the issue of equality amongst genders was only a women's issue on which all women were to agitate. And I think what is great about my generation is that we've made it as much a men's issue as it is a women's issue. Now, in your role as a minister of women and child development and minority affairs, you actually have an unobstructed and unbiased view of how, I mean, you're sitting in a vantage point, right? <laughs> and I'm sitting in a vantage point irrespective of my ministry. <laughs> <laughs> I've had the privilege of serving in our country in a political organization as the national president of the women's wing, right. which means that I've been to every nook and corner of the country and helped more and more women to come to office. I think that is one of the greatest contributions I as an individual celebrate because uh, you can come to a position which is constitutionally important, but what can your legacy be? Should my legacy only be that I've been minister of so many different ministries? Should my legacy only be that uh, I was at the forefront with the Prime Minister's blessing of creating the PPE industry in the country? I've had the privilege as Minister of Education of drafting the national education policy. Um, I've had the privilege as Minister of Education to build India's first MOOCs platform uh, indigenously without any foreign help. Now, that being said, uh, if you're looking at vantage points, I think my process of politicking as an individual is what has given me that um, additional edge when it comes to issues which are grassroots in nature. Right. I uh, am extremely defiant when it comes to the issue of women looking at women's issues. Mm. I think no man is ever expected to look at only men's issues. And Prime Minister Modi has served this idea well when in the Women and Child Development Ministry, it's not only the cabinet minister who is a woman, but the minister of state is a man. And I think uh, to presume that only women should have a vantage point, uh, I think does great disservice to the whole process, the churn that is being undertaken by many on issues of gender justice. But when you look at grassroots, how are you seeing progress? I think uh, the, I mean, narratives, over a decade. the narratives internationally about us haven't changed. Okay. For instance, and again I talk about the generational impact, I've been on platforms where many a civil society leaders and thought leaders have spoken about uh, challenges confronting Indian women. And the narratives are the old stayed ones that were 30 years old. Nobody's allowing me to study. Now, if you ask any young girl in India today, uh, is she disallowed from gaining an education? Um, and I come from a financially disenfranchised background. I don't come from a very, very rich family or an upper middle class family. In fact, I come from a um, slightly, um, you know, uh, lower middle class family right there at the edge. Uh, and that is why I speak from experience, which is not uh, tethered with a lot of financial um, backing in my growing years. And I think if you ask any young lady today, is she disallowed from anything? I think the expansion of technology and the impact of it in terms of discourse, also you will find that not many women are deliberately kept behind. India mercifully is a society where we have various communities and thought processes and cultures and languages, religions coming together. But the dominant part of our social fabric and narrative is that every woman is given a choice to live her life her way. I always tell women, there are consequences to choice, good and bad. Right. And if you take responsibility for the consequences that follow your choices, I don't think there's anybody who can keep you back. So I, I do feel that when it comes to women's issues, one, 
it should not be only gender significant from a perspective of women. Two, I don't think that only particular constitutional positions give you a better advantage to look at women's issues. For instance, for too long we have believed that the Women and Child Development Ministry is the women's ministry. Yeah. I do not believe that. I think the infrastructure ministry is equally women's ministry. I think the defense allocation in terms of the budget is equally a women's issue. I also believe if we are talking about interlinking of rivers, if you are talking about waterways, that is a women's issue because we are consumers, we are part of the process which uh, are a part of manufacturing uh, those parts or those systems. Uh, we are very much professionals who give services on those systems. So. Uh, it would be uh, digressive of us right. if we think that only soft issues are women's issues. You know, I was just looking at the, at the data on uh, women in STEM, especially in education. It's striking today that 40% of STEM students in India. 46% graduates are women. Women. No, yes. you know, it's, it's really, I mean, that's a huge amount of progress. Absolutely. Even in I about think two that to three what decades. we have not managed to do is make a financial case for gender parity in STEM. We have made a financial case for gender parity in the labor force. We have made a case uh, as Indians for gender parity in uh, enterprise, which is led by women. We're slowly making a case for women-led enterprise where you need more and more funds coming in from VCs. Uh, but there is yet a case to be made uh, financially for women in STEM. Because we look at women in STEM from a perspective of entry-level administrative uh, scientific backup. We do not, uh, I believe uh, till now, look at possibilities of helping women turn their scientific ideas or innovation into enterprise. That is still an area of challenge. And I think once we address the financial cause yeah. and make it for women uh, and gender parity in STEM, we will see those numbers increase from 46% graduates that we have currently. In fact, actually, this has been a, an area of focus for us, uh, especially because, you know, uh, we do have a lot of plants. A lot of the work that we do require uh, STEM, STEM graduates. We started off with this program called the Betia Scholarships, where, you know, we get, uh, we now have at least about 100 institutes where we provide the Betia Scholarships so that we get them. I think that one of the challenges we have with women in STEM is that early learning and methodologies which uh, especially inculcate uh, inquisite nature in, in science uh, dominantly uh, is something that needs hand holding from grade 8 yeah. onwards. Because if you look at the educational output with regards to mathematics and science, there is numbers which prove that young girls lag behind or for that matter even if they excel up to grade 8 or grade 10 post grade 10 that is when they start dropping out the difference is that between grade 8 and grade 10 the challenge is that if foundational learnings of mathematics and science is not strong and young girls do not get additional support that's when they find themselves at a crossroads where they rather not choose science yeah. for the fear of failure yeah. or for the fear of understanding foundationally what mathematics was all about yeah. from grade 10 onwards up to grade 12 it is about whether they will find fiscal support to partake in competitive exams mm. or find fiscal support to be a part of a higher education establishment which is steeped in technology because the fees and the scales uh, uh, of monies for engagement in such institutions is very high. So I think those predominantly are the challenge for young girls in STEM. What we tend to do as a society and as thought leaders uh, is look at the women's issue from a STEM perspective post grade 12. Yeah. And we are trying to fix the problem at the college level. If we start looking at the problem earlier from grade 8 onwards to 10 and for that matter from grade 10 to 12, I think you will see a huge influx of young ladies in technology and science-based institutions. We had, when I was Minister Education, done a project with CBSC. We had chosen close to 500 girls from across the country mm -hmm. uh, from very, very poor uh, financial backgrounds. We had given them a loaded up uh, digital device uh, for competitive exams. We had retired teachers and school principals who were available on a 24-7 helpline with them. And our experiment was to see how many of them actually go into technology institutions. And I'm happy to tell you 100% uh, success. 
and then it became uh, part of the uh, process. Today, uh, the national education policy has a gender inclusion fund specifically for the first time in the history of our country, which is a part of the national now uh, pledge uh, in terms of women's education. So I think that, um, yes, we are trying to fix the problem uh, at the level of scientific-based enterprise. Yes, we are trying to fix the problem at the higher education level uh, when it comes to our colleges and our university systems. If we look at grade 8 onwards as well, I think we will do great justice to women's capacity in STEM. You know, the very fact that we already, through the progress over the last three decades, the fact that we have 46 percent itself is huge progress, but there's still work to be done, as you rightly yes, say. Yes, I think that cognitive skills that develop early, um, and it's a very small experiment many uh, theorists have done, uh, where a girl child is introduced with, let's say, a playset. Uh, or a doll yeah. and a boy child is introduced with uh, a car or building blocks yeah. and that's where the cognitive skills suddenly take a shift. Um, there are so many parents who will spend tremendous amount of time um, by trying to teach the boy child ma mathematics and multiplication tables. Uh, the yeah. same may not have been spent on a young girl in the formative years. I think those parenting skills also need a little need, bit need, of need a new change. Yeah. Shifting gears uh, from STEM, uh, if you were to look at you know, health and education as a catalyst to drive gender equality, you know, where do you see progress and also where do you see we opportunities? We need to just tweak that uh, a bit. We need to speak not only of gender equality, but also equity. Because within the gender complex is also segments of our community that have been historically challenged vis-a-vis uh, -vis their own community's backgrounds, mm -hmm. where they have been denied proper access, let's say, to education or to better means of living. Let's say in the tribal communities, where language becomes a huge challenge. So how do you address that issue? And I think that apart from equality, we need to talk about the issue of equity as well. How much of our learning systems now provides for an amalgam of such communities into the mainstream? For instance, if, if you look at most of our academic output today, or the availability of academic um, instruments, they are predominantly in English. Now, in a country which has 125 constitutionally recognized languages, 16,000 dialects, can you imagine a dominance <coughs> of a particular language which many people just don't speak? So what happens when they transition in the academic systems from speaking, let's say, a tribal language or a native language into English, um, most get left behind because they can't compete. Uh, most get left behind because they can't comprehend it infuses a, uh, a very complex sense of self. Uh, and I think that the new education policy tries to address that anomaly as well and says that now we would like to encourage more and more people to educate themselves in their local language or their mother tongue. And I think that when it comes to women, that is a challenge, especially when it comes to technology. Okay. Your technology is available in English. Very limited technology is available in Hindi. That means a huge chunk of the female engagement on technological devices again gets curtailed. But is it only limited to uh, girls or it's also limited, it, 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 this challenge is there even, it's, it's gender neutral? I think that one challenge that we have, which is not um, dominant in conversation, is access to digital devices. So if per family you have one digital device, who gets to use it first and for what purpose? Yeah. So if you look at the purpose of engagement with a dig uh, digital device, does it change for women vis-a-vis -vis men? How many women are using digital devices for, let's say, infotainment? How many men depend on it for infotainment vis-a-vis -vis other services that they can access to? So it would be a very interesting survey or research if somebody did it. No such research exists. It exists as part of them, yeah. Right. But I also feel that with the government introducing the uh, PLI scheme on devices mm -hmm. uh, to ensure that we push the Make in India manufacturing uh, and expand the base for manufacturing indigenous uh, digital devices, I'm hopeful that it will uh, give a better uh, opportunity for women to engage on academic issues or for that matter s issues related to services that are available today from a gender perspective. Right. And there are quite a number of 
you know, startups who are in this edtech space where they're looking at access to education, uh, even in the smaller towns in uh, the same area. I think that um, it is, uh, in terms of access, I think today we have multiple modes of communication, multiple media uh, through which such um, academic adventures can be offered. The issue is uh, one, uh, the availability of the device in a local language. Mm. Uh, the second is the affordability. So if we can crack the affordable and the access part, I think the, uh, the future in terms of digital engagement vis-a-vis -vis women is going to be historic. Yeah, right. right. And what about health? Um, I mean, and so uh, in so far as health is concerned, I think that uh, the progression that we've made from the sectoral point of view and engagement on academia and skills is very interesting. The Prime Minister has uh, announced, and now it's functional, uh, close to one lakh he health and wellness centers, thereby giving a whole opportunity of engagement on care economy. Right. He has also obviously announced 157 uh, nursing colleges, along with medical colleges, which are being established in many a districts which never had a medical college before. And I think that itself, again, gives an impetus to the female component in the health sector. We have a very, very vibrant Ayurveda system, which is doing very well uh, from a wellness perspective. That again gives a, a, a variance in, uh, in terms of choices for women who want to be a part of the care economy. And I also feel that in um, some uh, international economies, we have done very well uh, from a medical support and healthcare frontline workers perspective. Mm -hmm. So be it an international engagement or domestic possibilities, the sky's the lim limit for women. But I would rather that apart from being a part of the service faculty, they also become a part of the manufacturing process. So if there are one lakh health and wellness centers, who supplies the medical devices. We recently had an announcement by the government on medical devices. How many of those uh, entrepreneurs turn out to be women, women is women something women I'll women watch women. out for. Yeah, yeah. No, for us, I think the one thing which has troubled us a lot is especially post-puberty, especially in the smaller towns, and we've talked this before, uh, ma'am, uh, the fact that girls actually take those four days off, they don't attend schools, and the fact that they start getting left behind is something that has that has troubled us and that's something that you know we've passionately gone after but we have an initiative I think we, that which, the yeah. prime minister's endeavor one to uh, ensure that the janoshadhi kendra has 40 products specifically for women and the fact that a male prime minister and the first prime minister ever in the living history of our country spoke about access to a sanitary pad at one rupee from the ramparts of the red fort was a defining moment in our democratic history uh, we in the government under the Prime Minister's leadership are ensuring that access to such affordable products is expanded. And I think that when you come to such a pass uh, where you have a Prime Minister who leads from the front on issues such as menstrual hygiene, I'm glad to share that the Prime Minister is the first ever to give the country an administrative protocol for menstrual hygiene and how to dispose of menstrual hygiene waste, uh, product waste. And I think that shows the detail to which the government has gone on issues such as menstrual hygiene and access to such products. I think that there are a variety of products today available in the market. There are some which I'm a bit uh, circumspect about uh, as somebody who uses such a product. Um, there are some uh, who are happy to take feedback, such as yourself. Um, there are some who are toying with um, sustainable uh, menstrual hygiene products. So uh, the market is expanding. Uh, the government is very cognizant of the needs of women. And that is why through Jan Aushadhi Kendras, we've had, I think, uh, over 32 crore such products made available to women in our country, which is a significant number. Okay, great. Shifting gears and looking at the future, if you were to imagine the ideal potential national growth with equality as a, as a key driver, what would it look like in your opinion? I think uh, it serves the country well to have pragmatic politicians and not politicians who live in imaginations. So I am a firm believer, I never tell anybody that I am here to offer a utopian state. Because with an uh, expanding um, base, um, with an expanding population, 
aspirations will keep changing. Um, many will be inspired to do uh, disruptions in the market. Many would want to retain status quo. What we need as citizens is a government that is dedicated to finding solutions with alacrity. We also can assure, at least I can as a politician, that I will endeavor towards ensuring that utopian state. But let's be mindful and if we are to speak plainly without lying to the audience that listens to us today, there have been economies around the world that have done stupendously well for themselves that are considered developed. We in India have done much better for gender justice. Let me give you a small example. Since the 1960s, a legislation was pending in our parliament with regards to medical termination of pregnancy. Uh, we in the government were extremely elated when the Prime Minister himself led from the front and ensured that that piece of legislation of medical termination of pregnancy at 24 weeks was passed in both houses of parliament. Now what is great about my country and I am preening now as an Indian woman is that no man in my country uh, spoke against that bill. Every man in my country supported it, be it a politician or uh, a citizen. And I think that is what is unique about our country. There have been countries, like I said, who are considered financially developed vis-a-vis uh, -vis India. We are now the fifth largest economy in the world. But we've done much more uh, for women's issues and women's rights. And we've been much more progressive in our inputs as thought leaders or policy makers than many are countries in the world. The fact that now we have in service the first ever female tribal president, that the supreme commander of the armed forces is a lady from a very, very poor family in a village in Odisha uh, in India, gladdens my heart because that's an inspiration not only for young girls in my country, but for women across the world. That men and women, she was proposed to be the president of India by the prime minister who happens to be a man. So the fact that men and women in our country work in tandem to ensure gender justice is delivered is something which is inspirational. Uh, uh, that's all I had, ma'am, but I just wanted to just let you know that, you know, uh, at PNG, for us, di diversity matters, right? And uh, why it matters is because we've seen that diversity breeds curiosity and creativity, which in turn, you know, paves the way for innovation and business growth, right? So we believe that you don't go in for gender equality or uh, diversity and inclusion just as a nice thing to do. It's, it is something which is a business imperative. And I want to get your thoughts. I on that. don't look at issues of inclusion from the lens of profit. I don't look at the issue of inclusion from the lens of corporate responsibility. I think it's the humane thing to do. Be it a corporate leader or an administrator or a politician or just a global citizen. If you're not inclusive, the question you should pose to yourself is are you human enough? Mm. Right, right. So I, actually for us, uh, you know, some of the things that we have been able to do over the last many years has been, and it's not just about female alone, but it's about, you know, how do we drive equality and inclusion in, in, a, uh, in, a, in the true sense of the word. I'll give you an example. We have this policy called share the care, where we, the maternity leave and paternity leave is equal. So we believe that you know men have a ro role to play in caregiving. As and long as the men who are taking leave ensure that they are not lounging about at home and making the women work, I'm happy. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. So uh, again, for us, you know, we truly believe that we are a force for growth and a force for go uh, force for good. We are actually 185 years young, if you will. Well, I'm 25 years young with PNG. Right. They say <laughs> life comes a full circle. And I did my first uh, PNG, my first assignment ever as a public personality with PNG. I believe you were in charge then of that particular product. No, I was, I was just a project manager. <laughs> yeah, no, I think that just a project manager and what you are today and just a model and what I am today speaks volumes about the PNG experience. Uh, I also believe that companies come and go. Legacies are made when you make an effort to go beyond the product and become a part of the people. Yeah. And I think that's what you've done. My compliments to you because when I saw you first, I saw you as a consumer. I had complaints about a particular product. And you were 
generous enough to put aside everything else and hear my feedback first. And I think that is why you've had a legacy of customers with you. The fact that you keep your ears to the ground and your heart open for feedback. Thank, Thank you so much, ma'am. That's what Thank makes you. you what you are today. Thank, Thank you so much, ma'am, for, for both the feedback and actually joining us. And uh, really appreciate your time. Pleasure.